Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, semua dah ada ke? Ke tak ada lagi? Ad, ada lagi dua orang. Ah uh, tak apa. Kalau ada orang ada inform eh. Okey. Okey. Doktor boleh start dah ke? Okay, boleh start lah. Kita mula dengan Nur Kitab Al-Fatihah. Uh, ada berapa presentasi eh, malam ni? Lima. Lima doktor. Okey, lima okey lah. So, sebelum ni, rasa grup sebelumnya ada sembilan lah. Kena ada lapan, sembilan. Sembilan, dua, dua, tiga jam tak habis. So boleh lah, hopefully kita boleh habis dalam dalam masa one hour plus. Okey, boleh proceed. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum. My name is Umir Khairan Tiyako. Uh, I'm the first presenter for today. So I'm going to present about nebulization. Okay, next. So as we uh, discuss about nebulization, so we, need, uh, so we must already know about it's related to respiratory system. So I guess that like, everyone already know organs that involve in the respiratory system. Okay, next. So what is uh, nebulization? Nebulization is a therapy that delivers respiratory drugs directly to the lungs. And uh, nebulizer, nebulizer is a device that can convert a liquid solution or suspension into aerosol droplets that's suitable for patient inhalation. Next. 
So what are the purpose uh, um, purpose of uh, this procedure? Okay. The purpose uh, is uh, nebulization, nebulization is uh, to relieve respiratory insufficiency due to bronchospasm. Uh, it also to correct uh, the underlying respiratory disorder to liquefy and remove heating heat secretion and also to reduce inflammatory and allergic response of the upper respiratory tract. So um, the table here uh, show uh, a few uh, drug type, uh, type of drugs that are uh, used in uh, nebulization, which are dilators and anti-inflammatories. So this one to screen airway obstruction, antibiotic for infection, and mucolytic for abnormal secretion. Next. So this is indication for nebulization. Actually, there are a lot more. So the listed one, just a few of, of it, of them. And then, uh, okay, uh, example here is a bronchial asthma, bronch bronchiolitis, cystic fibrosis, laryngeal tracheal bronchitis. Next. Okay. Uh, control indication for nebulization. In some cases, uh, nebula nebulization is rest restricted or need to apply uh, due to uh, there is a possible uh, untoward result or there is a less uh, effectiveness of nebulization for that patient. Uh, for example, such as patient uh, with unstable and increased blood pressure or those with cardiac irritability because this uh, nebulization may result to this arrhythmia and then those with uh, increased pulses and unconscious patient. Okay, next. So these are the components for uh, this procedure for nebulization which are we uh, so here we have uh, driving force, which is machine, tubing force, uh, medicine cup, and mass, uh, mass, mass and mouthpiece. Next, next. Okay, so this is a uh, differences uh, between mouthpiece and also fast mass. Okay, for mouthpiece, there is no drug leakage when use it, and there is no drug deposition, uh, no drug deposition in the nasal passage or face, and this, uh, this is more efficient to deliver drug. And for the face mask, it is easy for patient to use. However, drug uh, can be deposited in the nasal, uh, nasal passage or face. So, uh, this one might. Uh, not enough drug are uh, being 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 uh, transmitted in directly to the targeted area. Next, so how to use a nebulizer? Firstly, wash your hand, and then place the medication into the cup. Then, uh, attach the mouthpiece or uh, face mask. And then connect the tube, turn on the air compressor, and then uh, continue to inhale the medication. So at the last uh, step, we need to uh, educate a patient how, uh, how to inhale the medication. So we need to tell the patient to take a uh, deep breath. Okay, next. So this is a, uh, a video that uh, explain more about the, this procedure. So firstly, we need to ensure. So Dengar firstly, tak video. Video tadi dengar tak? Video. Uh, so okay, so okay, I will explain uh, the procedure. Oh, sekejap. Tak dengar. Tak dengar video tadi? Tak ada. Tak tahu. 
Bacaan ni hmm, Tak dengar Dengar tak? Kejap. Kejap. Tak dengar? Tak ah, dengar. Tak hmm. dengar. Tak apalah. Explain je kot. Ah, explain je. Okay, uh, first. Uh, start ready right? Uh, first, uh, we need to ensure the position of the patient. Okay, next we uh, need to ensure the correct, correct uh, alignment of the uh, medicine cup. So if... Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, so uh, after we uh correct the position, patient position. So So firstly, we need to ensure correct patient position ni. Okay. The position need to uh, 35 degree. And then uh, ensure correct nebulization, nebulizer alignment because uh, the content in the cup will uh, content of the cup will affect uh, the drug the drop um, would uh, nebulization is good or not. Uh, because if medication uh, tip, uh, if uh, the patient uh, lay, lay down uh, 180 degrees, so uh, the medication tip away from the jet gas part. So, uh, it does not, uh, cannot be, uh, cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, used. Uh. And then, uh, so the correct one is the patient need to, to, uh, to be in 35 degree position. Next. And then um, connect tubing to the oxygen source. So the recommended uh, one. Next, the recommended uh, oxygen source is uh, nine. And uh, this are recommended oxygen flow, nine liter per minute. So these are uh, gas sources. Actually, uh, there are a mixture of oxygen and also uh, helium. And it frequently used if there, is, uh, if there are no contraindications. So make sure gas flow when uh, tube or 
when connecting uh, the tubing. Next. Uh, so, uh, so to ensure that uh, that one uh, that the tubing must be connected uh, in order for us to reduce the wasted uh, drug and uh, increase uh, the effectiveness of the nebulization. So this one is uh, load medication in nebulizer on how to load medication in nebulizer. Actually, there are a cup there to so just put uh, drug inside that. Then attach the interface. And then the treatment time is 10 to 20 minutes. And that's all. Okay, next. Uh, so, The last uh, part is a uh, side effect of this procedure, which are uh, next slide. Uh, so effect of uh, nebulization, the patient might have um might have dry or irritated fluid. Uh, temporary or occasional cough, sneezing, stuffy or itchy nose, watery eyes, and then burning or bleeding of the nose. Then the patient might have nausea, heart pain, or stomach pain. And the patient uh, also can get uh, dizziness, um, drowsiness, headache, and it uh, can have, the patient might have an uh, unpleasant uh, Taste in our uh, mouth. Okay, I think that's all for me. Um, okay, nebulization is straightforward, lah, kan? Uh, so do we use air or oxygen for nebulization? Oxygen. Why can we use air? Um, MDI? Mm, no, I mean, why why can we use air? Oh, why? Okay. I mean, for nebulization rather than oxygen. Actually, we can use both. Okay, we can use both. Uh, we don't. We it is not necessary to use oxygen actually for nebulization. And if you go to KK and for any KK or any GP, they don't use oxygen for nebulization because they, they use the they were the one with uh, oxygen con with the concentrator, huh? so just connected to air lah, to air. No, even room air pun tak apa. Sometimes they connect to wall air lah. You don't yeah you don't have to give uh, nebulization to oxygen. Uh, even sometimes it can be dangerous giving nebulization to oxygen because when you connect the nebulizer uh, nebulizer to the wall oxygen okay, you are giving 100% oxygen okay, remember you are giving 100% oxygen from the wall <coughs> so in some cases for example like COPD and maybe in pediatric that's not lah. tapi in pediatric pun some 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 patient can be dangerous okay tapi kalau in COPD for example patient memang uh, this at the chronic CO2 retention, you you give nebulizer, ne nebulization via 100% oxygen, patient will stop breathing, okay? Because they've got chronic CO2 retention, kan? So they are, they are hypoxic drive, they are dependent on the hypoxia, kan? So if you 100% oxygen, then they can actually stop breathing, okay? So usually you just need to give uh, nebulization through air, via air, via air lah. Uh, tapi, uh, sometimes you uh, sometimes call you tadi air kan you just use tank oxygen tank then you you, you will giving you will give like hundred percent oxygen so in the, like for example in prem kan we rarely give 
I mean, we almost never give nebulization, uh, nebulized drug uh, to preterm baby. <coughs> but uh, there are actually some drugs can be given by a nebulization uh, to preterm baby. Uh, and if you want to give nebulization to preterm baby, it has to be uh, using uh, room air, not using oxygen. Can okay, not use 100% oxygen. Okay lah. Pasal so, why is it 9 liter? Does it have to be 9 liter per minute with the flow? Where where did you quote this? Is it from the video? Ah, <coughs> don't take a video. This one 9 liter, 9 liter per minute. I'm not sure about that lah, because I never, I mean, the 9 liter never been come across my mind. And actually, I did some searching while you presenting just now. Uh, actually, uh, most guidelines say it's more, at least at least 6. It's not, there's no like specific 9 liter, but it has to be at least 6 liter per minute. Because the higher the flow, <coughs> the smaller the particle will be, okay? If you give like 15 liter flow, uh, of air or oxygen uh, via nebulization via nebulizer, then you are going to deliver the drug to the alveoli rather than to your bronchioles. Can okay, you not bagi bronchodilators? You are, you are, if you are administering bronchodilators, you want the drug to end at the bronchioles, okay, at the bronch bronchus or bronchioles. So, <coughs> you respect your terminal bronchioles, and okay? so, that's where the obstruction are. Tapi kalau you give too high flow, uh, flow of like 15, 10, 10 above, like 10, 15, it won't be effective because you the drug will end up at the alveoli, so it won't work. Okay, that's why you need the flow to be bit around 6, 7, or maybe slightly 8, la, 8. But I never heard about 9, la, but it's usually about 6, 7, 8. Maybe in a drug they use 9 uh, because, they want, because they want to penetrate deeper for any reason. But for bronchodilator, it has to be around six, seven. Okay. Okay, lah. Satu je. Ada any questions? Any other questions? Ah, uh, doctor, musim COVID ni kita pakai lagi ke nap? Ha, boleh tak pakai nap musim COVID? Boleh tak? You Hari can. tu macam tengah tak boleh. Oh. Okay, actually you can lah. Kalau tanya boleh tak boleh, the answer is can. Tapi it's not recommended. Okay, only in severe cases and you cannot deliver the medication via other routes, then you have to use stabilizer lah. But in fact, studies shown that using MDI, a proper te MDI technique, is just equally good as stabilization. Okay, uh, but the aerosol produced by nebulizer uh, it can actually spread the like, infection, COVID. Okay, lah, so the answer is no. Lah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I give you tips. Okay. Your exam, your, your future exam, near future exam, will have some element of COVID. Lah, some element of COVID management. So you have to read, look about, read around the guideline on COVID, management of COVID the separation, the isolation because a lot of questions will will cater COVID COVID related, COVID related uh, punya management lah for example like this nebulization so remember uh, you cannot give whenever for example if you are answering like uh, you have to be bronchodilator via MDI rather than via you have to be specific lah because nebulization is not allowed Okay lah. Any other questions? Kau tak kita sambung lembah panca. <coughs> tak ada eh? Okay lah. Uh, so, Nafal boleh present lembah panca. So, uh, Assalamualaikum uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, today I will present about uh, lembah panca. Next. So what is lambda puncture? 
uh, lobancer is a insertion of a specialized needle into the lumbar subarachnoid space to gain access to, to the CSF. So uh, the procedure is uh, the child relies on the side and is held still and the doctor will put a needle between the bones of the lower back, lower back and it uh, may be performed as part of the initial workup of a sick child and it also known as a uh, spinal tap. Okay, next. So this is the, uh, the anatomy of our uh, spinal cord and also our vertebra or backbone. So uh, usually the, uh, the needle will be inserted uh, between the L3 and L4 through the skin, through the uh, skin, uh, sub supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, and also uh, dura meter and arachnoid meter into the sub arachnoid space. And it is usually, it is, uh, have to be performed at the level of cauda equina. Uh, and usually the uh, spinal cord is end at L1. Uh, so we uh, the uh, the lumbar puncture have to take at the level of cauda equina. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay, okay next. Okay, for indication of uh, lumbar puncture, so first is for diagnosis. Diagnosis of uh, can be for CNS infection like meningitis, encephalitis, and also syphilis. It also can be for diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage and also for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Second, it can be done for evaluation also diagnosis of inflammatory CNS process like uh, multiple sclerosis and also Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is uh, an uh, autoimmune disease to check for any uh, increase in immunoglobulin. So next, uh, indication is for infusion of aesthetic chemotherapy or contrast agent into the spinal canal. Uh, and lastly, for the treatment of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Okay, and uh, next. So for contraindication, first one is for, uh, it is uh, contraindicated in idiopathic or suspicion of uh, increased intracranial pressure due to cerebral mass. So, uh, Lama will increase the IC, uh, lumbar puncture in increased ICP can cause uh, ankle herniation. So, uh, and this is uh, accepted as uh, accepted in therapeutic use of lumbar puncture to reduce the intracranial pressure. So, uh, okay, usually uh, before uh, before lumbar puncture, uh, neuroimaging uh, have to be done. Uh, to identify any cerebral edema or any space of pain lesion. Okay, next, uh, uh, the next point for contraindication is in hypertension with bradycardia and also deteriorating consciousness, which is in hemodynamic instability, which is in shock. Uh, before to to, done, to do the lava puncture, the patient should undergo uh, appropriate uh, resuscitation. So the next point for contact education is uh, there is bleeding diathesis, which is uh, there is uh, uncorrected coagulopathy, clotting defect, or, or the patient is on heparin or warfarin uh, because it can uh, have risk of spinal hematoma. And next, uh, if there, uh, it is also contact education if the patient has skin infection because uh, it, is increased, it will increase the risk of carrying the infection into the CSF with the lava puncture needle and then it can cause sepsis. And next, uh, it is also contraindicated in vertebral deformities like scoliosis or kyphosis. And, uh, and then the sixth one, the sixth point is abnormal respiratory uh, pattern uh, because the patient will have, uh, will become uh, apnea or hy hypoxemia during the lumbar puncture. And next, the last one is when the patient has acute spinal trauma. Okay, next. Okay, uh, where to insert? Just I like, just I had said before, uh, it is uh, at the imaginary line that cross the lumbar region of the back, joining the posterior superior iliac crest with cross, which is we call the L3 and L4. That is the uh, we can uh, we can imagine uh, by uh, looking at the superior iliac crest. And it usually at the, at, will cross at L3 and L4. 
between L3, L4 uh, vertebra. Okay, uh, next. Okay, for procedure, uh, is, uh, there is uh, two position that can be uh, done uh, in laba bangce. And the first one is lateral decubitus position, which is the uh, most common one lah for uh, for taking the lumbar, for doing the lumbar puncture. So first, uh, the local anesthesia is employed for lumbar puncture, and then the patient is placed in the lateral recumbent position with the hips, knees, and chin flexed toward the chest, so as to open the interlamina space. And then uh, we we can also. Uh, uh, the patient also can uh, hug a pillow maybe uh, to support the head because uh, when the head is too flex, it can cause uh, respiratory distress, uh, respiratory, it can uh, disrupt the respiratory. Lah. And also, uh, uh, they have to apply a topical anesthetic 30 to 45 minutes prior to the procedure. And uh, like I have said before, the spinal cord and at L1 and L2, L1 and L2 interspace. So the set for puncture are located at L3, L4 interspace. And then, uh, and then uh, restrain the patient in lateral decubitus position uh, to maximally flex spine without compromise, compromising airway and also keep alignment of feet. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the patient also have to keep alignment of feet, knees and hips. Okay, next. This is the second uh, position, which is in sitting position, uh, which is uh, the doctor have to restrain the infant in the seated position with maximum spinal flexion. And then uh, the procedure is drape the uh, patient below the buttocks and fenestrated drape opening over the puncture side. And also uh, insert needle, so bevel is parallel to the spinal cord. And also cannot make, uh, and in this position, uh, we cannot measure the pressure accurately. Okay, next. Okay, this is the uh, next the equipment, which is the spinal needle. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is um, many type of uh, spinal needle, and usually in the uh, in this procedure we use usually twenty two gauge, uh, and then the the size for the uh, the size for the needle below than one year old uh, we use one point five inch inch and then for one year to middle childhood to top two point five inches three point uh, for older children and adults uh, three point five inches and for large uh, adults we use larger larger size okay uh, next okay so first uh, the procedure we have to cleanse the skin with povidone iodine from uh, puncture site radially and then uh, uh, clean radially out to 10 cm and then allow it to dry. So, and then we drape uh, below patient and around side with penetrated drip and then we anesthetize with lidocaine. And then uh, after that, we insert spinal needle with stylet with bevel up to keep cutting edge and then aim towards the umbilicus directing needle slightly uh, cephalic. Uh, and then hold the needle firmly. Uh, next. And then uh, when uh, when there is a pop and we know that uh, it uh, is indicate uh, a sudden decrease in uh, resistance, which is indicate that the needle have uh, punch have uh, passed through the ligamentum level and also dura dura meter. And then after that we uh, remove the stylet, remove the stylet, and then check for flow of the spinal fluid. And then we uh, uh, we let the the fluid uh, to flow out into, into the container. Okay, next. And then uh, if no fluid, then we have to rotate the needle 90 degree and then uh, reinsert uh, stylet and advance needle slowly to checking for frequent, uh, checking frequently for CSF flow. And then uh, jugular vein compression also can increase CSF pressure in low flow situation. If bony resistance is felt immediately, then you are not in the spinal interspace. And then if bony resistance is felt deeply, then withdraw needle to the skin surface and redirect more cephalate and increase uh, patient flexion. And then if bloody fluid that does not clear or that clots result, then withdraw needle and reattempt at a different interspace. Okay, uh, next. Okay, this is uh, for manometry. 
uh, which is uh, when the CSF has flow, flow uh, outside, flow, and then uh, we attach a manometer to obtain a open, opening pressure if uh, there is desired for, for checking for the pressure. And then the pressure can also, it can only be accurately measured in lateral decubitus position and in the relaxed patient. And then the procedure is we attach the manometer with a three-way stop cock when free flow of CSF is obtained. And then read the column when highest level is achieved and respiratory variation is noted. Okay, next. Now this is the picture of the manometer and then how to check for the uh, pressure. Okay, next. Okay, this is the uh, the summary of the step for the spinal puncture or the lumbar puncture that I had uh, said earlier. This is the summary. Okay, uh, next. Okay, for complication. Okay, the first one is post lumbar puncture headache, which is the most common one of the uh, complication. And it is usually begins uh, 24 to 40 hours after the procedure. The probable uh, etiology is usually the continued leakage of the CSF and then uh, then we have to bilateral pressure or throbbing that is intensified in the upright position. Uh, the headache is uh, usually bilateral uh, and throbbing that is intensified in the upright position and it is usually self-limited, usually uh, will be uh, resolved less than seven days and it is uncommon, less than 10 years old. Then, and then for the next complication is post lumbar puncture back pain, which is uh, occasionally with short lived referred limb. And then uh, you can have this herniation if the needle advances too far. Okay, uh, next, uh, next complication is bloody tap or dry tap. The bloody tap is when there is micro trauma caused by the spinal needle. And then uh, dry tap if if there is misplacement or the patient is dehydrate, uh, dehydrated, the CSF is low. And then the next complication is infection. It can occur with breaks in the sterile technique, use of contaminated equipment and placement of the needle through the infected skin, like cellulitis, skin abscess and epidural abscess and also spinal abscess. The next complication is hemorrhage due to low platelet counts or coagulopathies. And lastly, uh, the last complication is post-dural puncture cerebral herniation, which is the most uh, serious, but it's very rare. Lah. And the risk of herniation is 0 to 5% in those patients who are known to have intracranial masses. So I think uh, that's all. Uh, thank you. <coughs> very good, very good. Uh, good presentation. Uh, very important topic. Uh, even though the procedure itself uh, we usually done by senior MO or even specialist. Uh, but it's a, it's a procedure that commonly done in pediatric. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you've mentioned that the, the spinal cord ends at L1, kan? So what is the structure called? Uh, what is structured at the level of L1 to cord? Okay, uh, because I, I expect you guys has to be good in anatomy, like you guys about that, you right? Okay, anyone? The anatomy of your spinal cord? Conus medullaris, correct? Yes, because you are the conus medullaris, kan? And then after conus medullaris, you are the... You are the... Itulah, cauda equina, and finally you are the film terminali, kan? So these are very important structure you have to... You have to remember, eh, the level. So in pediatric, it's about the same, uh, slightly higher up. Uh, no, actually in pediatric, it's slightly, it's sometimes slightly lower down. Uh, Condus pyloris can be about uh, at the level of L1 to L2, macam tu lah. Uh, and then the caudate crena is around, macam you mentioned, between L, uh, L3 to L5. So you've got two, two space lah yang you boleh attempt, between L3 to L4. Or L4, L5. Okay. Lepas tu, what else? Uh, okay. Any questions for LP, by the way? Any questions? 
Usually in small infant, kan, in small children, we use needle lah, we use blue needle rather than using LP needle, use blue needle. The 23 gauge needle. Uh, that's sufficient. And then uh, it, has, it is a sterile procedure. Um, and most of the time, actually LP should not, we should not sedate a uh, patient when when doing LP. So, sepatutnya lah because it will affect the the reading. Uh, for example, if you are assessing the lactate, kan? if you are measuring the lactate, CSF so lactate, uh, sedating the child will actually affect your lactate level. So, if you are assessing lactate, you should not sedate the child. And in fact, uh, in small children, you can actually just a good uh, hole by someone, I mean, a good hole can actually be sufficient uh, for LP. But in Malaysia and in our current practice, usually we sedate, lah, we sedate the child. <laughs> but definitely you need to sedate if uh, you are giving medication to the LPN, especially in cancer patient, like bagi intratical chemotherapy. Uh, then this is when you have to sedate because it, it takes some time to deliver the medication. Uh, and I think it's a bit painful. Lah. Uh, what else? Huh? And I personally think LP is much easier than inserting a branula because LP you can feel, okay, unless the child is like obese, then it'll be slightly difficult. But but when you're doing LP, you can actually palpate the bone, the bone, and you can actually feel the the space, huh? the potential space for insertion. Can I say to you? Are there any other questions? Any other? Okay, no. So next. Okay, MDI. Okay. Can you proceed? Next, uh, I'm going to present on how to use a metered dose inhaler with spacer. So uh, there are two types of uh, metered dose inhaler which are with spacer and without spacer. So a metered dose inhaler uh, are a handed aerosol device that use a propellant to deliver the therapeutic agent. In other words, it is a device as a mode of aerosol del delivery and are used to treat uh, respiratory disorders such as asthma and COPD. And the medication that usually use are uh, bronchodilator or corticosteroid or combination of both for treatment of asthma and COPD. And uh, a spacer is an external device that is attached to an MDI to allow for better drug delivery by enhanced actuation and inhalation coordination. Mm, that is uh, the spacer, the tube and the mask one. So next, let us watch how to use the inhaler.
Ellie. Video, video. Ya. Yeah. Video. Dah buka dah lah. Tak ada eh? Haa tak ada. Kena share video tu. Kasi ni kot. Kita kena stop powerpoint dulu eh? Uh, tak payah share screen tu. Share video tu. Kasi ni. Kasi lah tak tahu. Macam tu kan? Kalau kena share video tu. Tengok de uh, desktop tu. Tengok. Klik share screen tu, lepas tu pilih yang video. Oh, Ni, nampak tak? Video. Nampak. That is the spacer. Dah kot ni. Nampak slide tak? Nampak tapi dia tak slide show. So the indication uh, to use emitted dose inhaler is for patient with non COPD or asthma with acute exacerbations and also for patient without non respiratory distress who exhibit respiratory wheezing um, or and uh, in patient with non respiratory disease with evidence of airflow obstruction who require endotracheal intubation in order to control the degree of respiratory failure. Uh, that is. So uh, we have to know how to use the MDI in order to advise the patient how to use the MDI with aerochamber. And uh, the uh, 
Uh, for children, it is um, recommended to use a MDI with the spacer as it, uh, the child cannot uh, coordinate the breathing, uh, breathing with the inhalation. Mm. So how to use the MDI? First, we have to remove the inhaler cap, check for any foreign objects before using the inhaler. And next, we have to insert the inhaler into spacer and make sure the aero chamber forms a good seal around the inhaler. And then shake the inhaler. And then position. We, uh, we have to advise the child to stand up straight and tilt head back slightly. And breathe out completely before using the inhaler away from the inhaler. And then place the mask, the place the mask uh, firmly over the face, and then uh, press down the inhaler once, and then place a device over the face while taking five to six deep breath, and uh, after use after breathing we. After breathing, remove the mask and rinse mouth with water and with water and spit to avoid the corticosteroid inside the inside the child's mouth. And wipe face with a damp cloth. So, uh, advice for the mothers uh, that for so advice for the mothers how to monitor the child's usage of MDI. The mother should check the child's inhaler and spacer technique. Is, is it a correct technique? As a uh, incorrect technique will, um, will waste the medication as it will not deliver to the lung directly. And then uh, the mother should check the child uh, using the right inhaler and spacer or face mask. Uh, if it is easy, um, appropriate or a correct size with the child's face. And then uh, the mother should wash the spacer once a week and uh, by soaking in lukewarm water and with my detergent for 15 minutes and rinse well. And uh, the mother should should mother should uh, not brush or using a cloth do not brush the spacer or using a cloth to wipe the spacer to prevent electrostatic that will cause the particles of the medication to attach to the wall of the air chamber to attach to the wall of the spacer that will reduce the delivery of the medication to the lung and then uh, mother should air dry the aero chamber, not wiping the aero chamber. And then replace the spacer for every 6 to 12 months. Uh, there are contraindication in patient to use um, MDI. It is contraindicated in patient whose the airflow obstruction is due to an inhaled foreign body. And in patient with airflow obstruction and an acute myocardial infarction. And, that, and there are side effects of uh, MDI and we have to worry about the we have to worry about side effect, side effect of the MDI is uh, it can cause a fast or irregular heart rate and also it can cause a serious allergic reaction uh, a serious allergic reaction and, uh, and also it can uh, cause bronchospasm so that's all Sorry, uh, the last the last sentence you mentioned. Uh, what caused bronchospasm? Um, the the inhaler, the the medication. How did the medication cause bronchospasm? Mm. I mean, what medication caused bronchospasm? I thought the, the the use of medication, I mean the bronchodilators is actually to to oh. treat bronchospasm, right? Oh yeah. So how did it cause bronchospasm? Mm. Ah, 
if the patient have allergy to the medication. Okay, allergy to the medication. Okay, okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, hmm, medication. Okay, lah, okay, lah. Okay, lah. Acceptable. Lah. Anyway, so any any questions on the MDI? So what is the age? Okay, uh, what is the age? Uh, for you to to shift from spacer, I mean from the what you call it, you can from the spacer from the face mask, uh, to mouse piece. At what age can you start using mouse piece? More than eleven years old. Eleven years. Oh, oh you you touch well, okay. So ah, any guess? Yeah. Any guess? It's actually eight lah, eight year old. After eight year old, you can actually, uh, um, I mean, change to mouse piece because some sometimes mouse piece is if, if the child got good breathing coordination, then uh, mouse piece is actually better. Okay, uh, and then uh, what kind of MDI do you know? What are the option MDI that you know? This one is aerosol, can the mm. MDI that you usually use is aerosol? Mm. Okay. Uh, what other what other MDI do you know? Dry powder. Okay, dry powder. Okay, good. Lagi. Mm. That's the main two lah. Tapi the mechanism are the quite different. There are few other method lah. Few other few other method of delivery uh, of medication via MDI lah. Uh, so but the most common is aerosol and also dry powder, can. <coughs> Actually, kalau the child uh, old enough, maybe about 10, 11 years old, uh, you can actually use uh, easy inhaler rather than, uh, you know, the inhaler. You can actually use easy inhaler. So, the concept is similar to the mouse piece. Uh, lepas tu, you can even change to turbo inhaler lah kalau dia old enough and can, can coordinate. Okay, anyway, so another question about MDI. MDI is quite straightforward. Lah. So what MDI are you tahu? What MDI is available for treatment of asthma? What what type of MDI is available? What medication can actually uh, administered uh, or delivered via MDI? Sabutamol. Okay, Sabutamol again. Mm. Sabutamol. You had the steroids, kan? You had the fruticasone, and then you had the yeah. body snake. Apa yang you had? Tiofine. Tiofine, masa tak ada MDI ada. Tiofine, masa tak ada. Hmm. Newlin ada. Newlin, which is the uh, combivalent. Okay, combivalent. Hmm. Okay, and then then uh, the type of uh, uh, bronchodilator you have to know. Okay, you have to know. So how bronchodilator works? Okay, I know the method, the technique is also important, but you have to know the drug. Okay, how it works. So if you got a bronchospasm, okay, what actually, how to actually treat bronchospasm? See what causes bronchospasm? Beta two agonist. Okay, so that's that's the medication, kan? So mm. as the name reflects, so beta is what? Beta is receptor for what? Beta, two, beta one, receptor for? Sympathetic. Good, okay, for sympathetic kan? So beta one, beta two, alpha one, alpha two is sympathetic receptor kan? But sympathetic receptor yang dominant, uh, present dekat lung is your beta receptor, which is beta two lah, especially beta two. That's why, how, how sympathetic works? Kalau sympathetic simulator dekat lung, what, what, what will happen? It will become dilation. bronchodilation kan? That's why we give bronchodilator kan? Beta 1 agonist, eh beta 2 agonist Untuk dilate the airway Okay, that's how. So we we actually uh, augment, we actually excite the receptor, the beta receptor The sympathetic receptor kan dekat lung Okay, besides that, opposite to sympathetic, ada apa? 
para sympathetic kan so if you stimulate para sympathetic receptor dekat lung what will happen is by the sound tu lah bronco constriction kan bronco constriction so how to how to bronco dilate you can actually inhibit the the parasympathetic betul lah kan so in order to bronchodilate you can actually you can actually excite you can actually stimulate the sympathetic via b2 receptor or you can actually inhibit the parasympathetic receptor via what receptor parasympathetic yang you tahu cholinergic dia ada cholinergic mm-hmm. kan mascarinic mascarinic kan the main the main one is cholinergic and mascarinic so dekat lung ada apa what receptor is available dekat lung is mainly mascarinic okay mascarinic receptor yang paling banyak dekat lung so so how to inhibit mascarinic receptor you bagi mascarinic antagonist kan bagi mascarinic blocker so such as apa medication contoh atropine and atropium kan mascarinic ipatropium kan ipatropium tiotropium so ipatropium is a short acting tiotropium is a long acting okay so these are mascarinic antagonist okay faham tak so sama macam macam combivalent combivalent is a combination of sabutamol and ipatropium bromide short acting sama saba and also sama faham mascarinic antagonist and also saba saba is beta agonist. Okay, faham kan? So you have to understand the concept. Okay, the this is all basic physiology lah, physiology of your innovation. Sama juga contoh macam uh, contoh antiemetic kan, how it works. Antiemetic you works at dopamine receptor. Dopamine you can work centrally or peripherally. Uh, Doperidone works centrally. Perif- uh, Metoclopramide works peripherally. So, <coughs> all these receptors are very important. Okay, because contoh macam inotropes. How inotrope works. Uh, semua guna receptor, especially the uh, <coughs> the autonomic receptor kan. Autonomic nervous system. Okay, anyway, so tu je lah. Ni selingan. So, any other questions? And nowadays, uh, we are starting to use uh, itu tahu kan kita dah start kita dah start guna a uh, your corticosteroid MDI corticosteroid for acute okay before this we learn a uh, corticosteroid uh, MDI kan is actually inhaled corticosteroid is actually for preventer kan but now we are starting to use inhaled corticosteroid for acute exacerbation of asthma okay on top of that we are starting to use a uh, nebulized magnesium sulfate <coughs> uh, uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of medication for asthma. There's a lot. Okay, anyway, so boleh. Ada any last questions? Kau tak to continue with chest tube? Ada questions? Okay, kau tak ada jom. Uh, chest tube. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, next I'll be talking about a uh, chest tube insertion also known as a chest drain. So for the introduction, um, what is chest tube? Uh, basically it is a flexible soft tube which is placed uh, in the pleural space in between the visceral and the parietal pleura uh, which the main goal for the chest drain is to drain the fluid or blood or air in the pleural space in order to allow the expansion of the lung and to restore the negative um, pressure in the thoracic cavity. So basically in the left um, side image is it is the anatomical site for the chest tube insertion also known as the safe triangle as you can see uh, superiorly it is a base of the axilla, inferiorly is the fifth intercostal space, anteriorly is the lateral edge of the pectoris major and the posteriorly is a lateral edge of latissimus dorsi and on the right side uh, it shows the anatomy of the neurovascular bundles, which it is located just beneath the ribs. So for the chest tube insertion, the tube should be inserted uh, directly above the ribs in order to prevent the damage to the neurovascular bundles. 
So this is the indication for the chest tube, uh, which includes the pneumothorax, pleural effusion, uh, which uh, can be exudates or so transudates, chylothorax, which is the um, lymph fluid in the space, in pyema, pus in the space, hemothorax, uh, blood in the space, and administration of medication for pleural disease. Medication uh, includes the talcum, talc, which is the sclero sclerosing agents uh, for uh, pleurodesis. Basically, pleurodesis, it is a um, procedure to adhere both uh, the parietal and the visceral uh, layers, uh, which is the treatment for recurrent pleural effusion. For the contraindications uh, in the co coagulopathy or, or in the patients on uh, anticoagulant, or patient with a pulmonary bullet or pulmonary pleural or thoracic adhesions, or also in the uh, patient with the skin infection at the uh, insertion sites to prevent the introduction of the microbes in the pleural space. So uh, this is the equipment needed for the chest drain, which includes the shrink and needles, sterile glove and gown, sterile drapes, antiseptic solution, local anesthetic, surgical marker, uh, swab, chest drain. In children, we use 8, 10 or 12. Chest drain system, which is the underwater system. Scalpel blade, curve Kelly clamp, this one. And then the pressure suction system and also the suture kit addressing. As you can see, uh, this uh, used for prep, insert, and also for uh, the suture. So uh, before we perform the uh, chest tube incision, uh, we need to explain the procedure to the uh, care takers of the patients, how and why the chest tube need to be, um, in, uh, why, how and why the chest tube is needed. And also we need to explain the benefits and also the risks or complications of the procedure. And lastly, we need to gain the consent um, before we performing the uh, chest tube incision. And for uh, during the procedure, um, the procedure need to be done in a septic technique because uh, chest tube incision basically it is an invasive uh, procedure. So uh, a septic then is very important. So and next is the position of the patients um, in child or in baby. Uh, the, the baby can inline inline supine or it's better for the baby to. Uh, lying 45 degree off the back and also with the hands on the back of the uh, of, uh, back of the head to expose the uh, safe triangles. Next, the skin is uh, prepped with the um, alcohol and sterile drape and then we uh, inject the um, local anesthetic and the an incision is made uh, in children 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter just above the ribs in, uh, to avoid the damage to the neurovascular bundles. And then we use the uh, curved clamp to, to dissect or to separate the uh, tissue until the pleura. Once we, you, you reach the pleura, as you can feel the resistance, you can um, put a pressure until the pleural space is entered. And this clamp also we can use um, to um, guide the insertion of the tube. Basically, um, the direction of the tube it depends on the type of drainage. For example, for the uh, air drainage, the tube is directed superiorly and anteriorly to the apex of the lung. Meanwhile, for the um, fluid drainage, the tube is directed inferiorly and posteriorly in order to maximize the drainage. Uh, next, uh, one, one, the end of the one tube is um, attached to the underwater system. Meanwhile, the other end, we secure it to the skin with the suture. And the incision site is, then we close with the uh, gauze and also the uh, tegaderm. Basically, this is the procedure that has been mentioned just now. And the picture below shows the um, chest drain system. So after the procedure, we need to check for bubbling or oscillation of the water column. And also we need to confirm the tip position with the chest x-ray and document the procedure, the time, the date, uh, when the procedure has been done. 
and for the removal, once the bubbling uh, have not been seen for 24 hours, then we can discontinue the uh, suction and the drain is clamped. We need to repeat the chest x-ray in order to ensure that there is no reaccumulation or, mean, or meaning we can say that to ensure that there's no leftover fluid or air in the pleural space. Then uh, we remove the dressing, cut the suture and withdraw the drain, then close the wound with sterilized strips. Um, usually suture is rarely done compared to the stress strips for the closure of the wounds after removal of the tube. So this is the complication for the chest strain. Includes the pain or discomfort at the insertion site, placement out with pleural cavity, subcutaneous intra-abdominal solid organs, puncture of solid organ uh, like liver, spleen, heart, lung, or esophagus, puncture of intercostal artery, a malposition of the tube, intercostal neuralgia, or subcutaneous empyzema. For the position, positional factors, it includes the kink, block, or delochement of the tube, pulmonary edema, fistula, or pneumothorax when the tube we um, overshoot during the incision, and for infective, includes the wound infections and empyema. So um, this picture show um, the damage to the lung parenchymal during the insertion of the tube. This one shows um, the kink, the tube kink. This one is the uh, chest wall hematoma. And this is the um, infections on the skin, which is the complication of the chest strain. Uh, this is my references. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh... Okay, good. Uh, so there's actually two methods for chest tube insertion. What method do you know? Two method. Mm, there's a two method for chest tube insertion. There's one we call closed method, and the other one we call open method. Okay. Uh, so the one that you've seen here is actually this is a closed method. Okay, the one on the picture is actually closed method. Okay, where in closed method, you just nick, okay, you just nick, small nick, and you advance the troca, okay, the tube with the troca. The troca is the, the metal, the sharp metal. You just advance it, advance until you feel the giveaway, like giveaway. Then you you look at the with whether it's air or fluid, come out. Okay, this is what we call blind method. Blind method is the fastest, the easiest, um, but yet it's actually the most dangerous because you, do, you you didn't see the structure underneath, so you just puncture. Lah. But in pediatric, it's actually the best, it's actually open method. However, okay, open, open method means you explore, lah. you open, and then you visualize the structure underneath, the ribs lah, especially. Then uh, you nampak the ribs, Okay, you actually open up, you feel for the ribs, and then you visualize the ribs, then only you puncture. Okay, less risk of uh, complication, but it's much difficult huh? and the incision will be larger. Okay, um, but that's method. Tapi most of the time we use closed method. Okay, it's easier lah. And then, um, Okay, if you are if you plan to drain uh, a new motor X, where do you place your the tip of the chest tube for new motor X? Um, motor X to the apex at the midclavicular superior until to the apex of the lung. Okay, so kalau new motor X, you point upward. Then for mm -hmm. kalau you want to drain diffusion, then you point downward. Okay, that's very important. Okay, uh, because air, you know, they float, can so they raise up when patient uh, are at up sitting position, the air actually drains up. Okay, lepas tu, apa uh, And you can actually feel for the subcutaneous emphysema, no? Kalau, that's one of the complication. Okay, if there's a, like, uh, like, macam, 
porcu ah uh, omni placement dia then you can you can feel the subcutaneous emphysema and what else ah uh? hmm. what else any other questions and usually kita akan suture lah we don't use strip most of time we will suture Okay, usually we use per spring lah, per spring ataupun just suture lah. Tapi most of it is per spring. Uh, apa yang pergi? Ada lagi soalan? Complication wise. I think itu cukup kan? The size is different eh. You use smaller size for pneumothorax but use larger size for uh, emphysema. And then um, for pleural fusion. If you, and then from the pleural fusion, you can extend uh, the sample for analysis lah, whether to, to determine whether it is transudate or exudate. And then you can also use ultrasound to determine whether the empyema is actually, whether the pleural fusion has changed to empyema. And then how, what is the stage of empyema? In empyema, empyema thoracis, there are three stages of empyema thoracis. Wait on that, uh, and then the management is different. Okay, if you got a complex empyema, uh, the third stage of empyema, then uh, draining is not efficient. Uh, it's not sufficient. So you have to do something else. Now you can what? Uh, either you what? Uh, what you call it? Trombo, trombo. Trombo plastik lah, maksudnya you insert RTPA kan, RTPA ataupun streptokinase or RTPA into the into the pleural space, okay, uh, to thrombolyze, uh, thrombolytic, thrombolytic to thrombolyze the uh, the organisation, the complex empyema, or you can use uh, what you call it? I pun dah lupa nama dia. The one macam apa yang guna camera tu. Tengah. Tapi anyway, uh, so read around now. Read, you can. It's quite interesting. Read around on um, empyematoriasis, the management of empyematoriasis, uh, because it's you, you uh, it's not that uncommon lah. Empyema is quite, it's not that uncommon complication, and some uh, you may got the opportunity to to do thrombolytic therapy for empyema, or so uh, more invasive uh, endoscopic. Okay, uh, tu cukup. Ada any other questions tak? Doktor. Ha. Huh. Um, is it um common for the pediatrics to have empyema which is not the complication of the chest tube? Uh, Meaning, uh, you mean as complication from the chest tube? Decision? No, no. Uh, or pneumonia? Uh, empyema primarily. Ah, uh, uh, it's, it's quite common. It's quite common. It's, uh, it's not that uncommon. Uh, it's not that uncommon lah. Uh, especially if you if you did not treat the pleural effusion uh, adequately. For example, if the pleural effusion is 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 massive, you didn't drain the pleural effusion. You're just using medical treatment. Then chances are it will develop into empyema lah. Empyema and then finally it, it will become organized and become fibrin, fibrin uh, formation uh, and become complex and very mana. Uh, it's quite common, it's not that uncommon. Especially uh, empyema caused by things like TB and uh, TB uh, pleural effusion uh, or malignant pleural effusion. Uh, this is actually the more common cause of empyema. Okay, any other? Any other questions? Kalau tak ada tu cukup. Uh, oh, ada satu? Oh, lima eh? Ingat dah last. Last. Okay lah. Yeah. I thought ni dah last. Okay, okay tak apa-apa. Uh, continue lah. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, uh, I will be presenting about uh, pig chromatin. So, next. So uh, for the introduction, so um, pig chromometer is a small handheld device that measure how fast a person can blow out 
during forceful exhalation after maximum inhalation. Actually, there is a correction uh, in this slide um, after uh, maximum inhalation. So basically, it helps to determine uh, the degree of obstruction along the airways. Okay, next. Okay, so um, we can use a peak flow meter in several settings. First, uh, in um, in order to diagnose uh, the asthma, so when we can look for the variability of the measurement and also um, there is a, a there is difference um, uh, of the measurement after the patient use bronchodilator. Uh, it means that uh, if the patient respond or not to the bronchodilator. And next is um, also we can use for monitor disease progression, as, um, um, especially in the acute exacerbation of asthma and also safe management plan, um, which uh, can be divided into green, yellow and also red zone. Okay, so um, this one. Okay. Um, Okay, so for, for the green, um, it signals that uh, the person um, uh, has a all clears, means that there is no uh, obstruction. For the yellow, uh, it signals a caution. Um, it may, uh, may, uh, air, uh, it's may uh, presence of airways obstruction. Um, meanwhile, the red, uh, it uh, signals the medical alert. So um, the patient needs to um, have the bronchodilator therapy. Uh, so there is um, several measurement uh, in green, yellow and red. Usually in green, um, there is about 8, uh, 80 to 100% um, of personal best. Um, means that if someone have um, blow uh, the measurement to uh, uh, a certain measurement, uh, uh, let's say um, um, 100 liter per minute. So uh, 80 of that, um, if the patient can blow 80 to 100, so it means that it's good. For yellow, 50 to 80, and red is below 50, 50% of the personal best. Okay, next. Okay, uh, these are the types of uh, peak flow meter. Um, there is low range peak flow meter and so standard range. So um, in low range, usually we use in uh, four to nine years old children and also adults with severely impaired lung function because uh, in low range peak flow meter uh, we want to have a, a more accurate uh, measurement um, so uh, in other age older age uh, in other uh, group of age uh, we can use standard range of peak flow meter okay, next okay these are example of peak flow meter uh, and certain label, um, this is mouthpiece, um, measuring skills, and also curses. Okay, next. Okay, so this are uh, the the, uh, the procedure how to use the peak flow meter. First, set the cursor to zero. Do not touch the cursor when breathing out. And then uh, stand up and hold the peak flow meter horizontally in front of the mouth, and then take the deep breath. Uh, deep breath in and close the lips firmly around the mouthpiece and also making sure there is no air leak around the lips. And next, uh, breathe out as hard and as fast as possible and note the number indicated by the cursor. Okay, so and then uh, return cursor to zero and repeat this sequence twice or more uh, to obtain uh, the, uh, the several readings and the highest or the best reading of all measurement is peak flow at the time. Uh, so, uh, so the patient can uh, record the, the measurement in patient's daily asthma diary or recorded on a peak flow chart. And this is to ensure results of the peak, peak flow meter are comparable uh, and the patient is advised to use the meter in the same way each time and the same time each day. Okay. Next. Okay. So uh, the reading is different according to age, gender, and also height. Next. Okay. So this uh, table um, 
uh, about the prediction mean of uh, peak expiratory flow rate. So uh, we can uh, we can see that there is a different um, uh, for male and also uh, girls, uh, boys and girls, and also difference in height. So um, every height and also male, female, and also age uh, can um, have a different prediction of uh, PEFR. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, if we want to um, predict uh, the PEFR, we can use this formula. Uh, so uh, in children, um, uh, in the children, uh, as stated here, height uh, minus 100, uh, five times and plus 100. Okay, so um, and also in adults, um, as you can see here, I think I'm, I'm not mentioning it. Okay. So um, in, in children, uh, we need to use the height in centimeter. Okay, so, um, okay. okay, next. Okay, so uh, these are the disadvantages of the peak flow meter. Um, first one, um, peak flow meter, you need, uh, uh, you need a proper technique. Um, and sometimes a, um, a patient doesn't have uh, the proper technique, so the measurement uh, is not uh, is not accurate. Uh, and next, uh, it's also effort dependence. Uh, sometimes if patient uh, does not cooperate, so uh, we cannot um, have the the accurate measurement. And last but not least, actually the peak flow meter primarily assess the airflow in the larger airways and not in the medium or smaller airways. So sometimes uh, we can underestimate, uh, underestimate the degree of uh, airflow limitation. Um, okay, I think I think that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay, you dengar kan? Okay. So, uh, so when when can you say there's a reversibility of the airway obstruction? If the peak flow improved by berapa persen? And one of the most important uh, distinguishing features of asthma and compared to COPD or other uh, restrictive uh, other obstructive airway disease is actually the reversibility lah. and in fact uh, the latest GINA guideline is actually uh, emphasized on the uh, reversibility and the variation of of the peak flow uh, of the peak flow uh, measurement lah to actually diagnose asthma so what? How many percent? Twenty percent. Huh? Twenty percent improvement. Twenty twenty. More than fifteen. No. Uh, uh, more than twenty percent. Uh, for PEFR, more than twelve percent for FEV one. Okay, good. Bagus, bagus. Siapa yang jawab tadi? Siapa nama yang jawab? Siapa nama ayat dia? Uh -uh. Okay, you baca kat mana? Uh, dalam CPG CPG apa? CPG asthma? Uh -uh. 2018 eh? Okay, yeah. Thank you, Roxanne. Okay, so the answer is 20 and 12% lah kan? Uh, tapi actually, uh, now uh, So, but you have to remember satu je lah, so kita, kita tak guna PFR in pediatric and actually in most center pun kita tak buat lah, kita tak buat ni, kita just monitor the FEV1 kan, FEV1, that's what, when you use the peak flow, you are measuring the FEV1, okay, the one second FEV lah, so it's actually 12%, so 12% 12% improvement post MDI, post bronchodilator, uh, is diagnosis of asthma lah. Okay, supporting asthma. Hmm, okay, apa lagi ya? 
Okay, lepas so member uh, the predictor uh, the predictor value is actually based on height and sex, height, age and sex. Okay kan? Height and sex lah, age tak penting sebab tapi height and sex. Okay, okay ada lagi soalan? Ada apa-apa soalan tak? Hmm? Uh, doktor, in children yang under 3 years old kan? Kita hmm. guna ke yang FEV1 untuk diagnose asthma ni? Uh, actually, children, small children tak guna pun pit flow. We, we cannot use pit flow in small children. But we can use PFR. Uh, we can use uh, we can use spirometer. There's a special spirometer. But yet, we it's only in research setting lah. But in clinical setting, we don't use pit flow to diagnosing or to assessing asthma in small children. Most of the time, the youngest would be maybe five year old, six year old. Less than that, we won't use. We don't use pit flow lah. Okay. Okay, okay. So, kita pakai API lah untuk diagnose under 3 ni je. Okay, then. Asthma is a diagnosis by clinical and history. So, API is to support. Okay, API to support. Tapi by 3 years old, we don't, nowadays we won't, we, we don't diagnose asthma at 3 years old. We only diagnose asthma at 5, more than 5, 5 or more. Because we know that from studies, uh, most of these children, they're presented with, with wheezing. Uh, during the early age of life, uh, less than five years old, after five, they come out of it. They come out of wheezing episodes uh, for no reason. Even though wheezing can be multi triggered, can be viral induced, uh, or episodic with no apparent reason, but most of the time, these children, uh, a lot of them, I think more than 30, 30 to 40 percent of them, by five year old, they, they, they will stop having wheezing. So these are not asthma. These are wizards lah. Okay, faham tak? Okay, faham. Hmm. But if a patient with strong API kan, because API kita tahu is uh, uh, you, we, use, we apply API after the child is more than 2 year old or 3, I think 3 kot. 2 year old, the first 2 years of life kan. Kalau less than 2 years old, you may tak boleh apply pun API. API can be applied after 2 years old. Uh, so, if those with strong API, we won't label them asthma until they're five years old. Okay. However, however, uh, clinically the the distinguished features are quite uh, grey lah. So basically, sometimes we do diagnose asthma at four, even three years old. If there's very high suspicious, uh, and patient that, that is kind of chronicity lah. For example, like that the has a sulcus growth that affected, uh, then this this type of children will get the diagnosis earlier. Okay, the solid. There any any questions? Uh, doctor, uh, maksudnya kan? Kalau patient tu less than 2 years old eh Kalau hmm. dia datang dengan respiratory problem Kita hmm. boleh still consider asthma as DDX ke? We can We can but uh, Unless you are confident enough And usually Kalau baby small children Diagnosis of asthma, diagnosing of as diagnosis of asthma is given by respiratory physician ya yeah. Kalau even pediatrician pun kita tak pediatrician kita tak diagnose asma Kita akan diagnose as wheeze lah, episodic wheeze So better you put the diagnosis of episodic, episodic wheeze Bro, I mean from, from this here you can determine whether this is multi-figured wheeze Ataupun uh, this this is uh, viral induced wheeze Or just episodic wheeze, we don't know why They wheeze uh, and then you can put other diagnosis lah, other diagnosis like bronchitis, if, if younger than one or younger than two even you can actually put uh, bronchitis. Uh, but it's, if recurrent then you say it's episodic wheeze lah, so recurrent. So just first or second episode then you can say bronchitis. Okay. Hmm, what do you put? 
Kalau asma after five no. See. At your level just just choose five as your cut off point. But you can still put in your differential, but you can justify. However, we don't usually diagnose asthma below five years old. Okay. However, this child got very strong family history of asthma, strong API, then chances are he she's asthmatic. Okay. I think it's all right. It's okay, class and siapa lah. You guys semua eh. The same people ke? Kan saya ada bad side teaching kan dengan dia tu eh. Bukan dengan group tiga okay. tak? Oh, group tiga eh. You guys belum apa? Group dua? Group four. You guys group four. Eh, you guys yang punya mentee eh. Apa? Kan? <laughs> you guys yang punya mentee kan? Oh, okay lah, okay lah. Tak apa lah. So, so, ada last question before we dismiss? Okay, tak ada. Okay, then uh, the tanggul lah. Nak tak speak up for us. Okay, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Adel. Thank you, Adel. Uh, eh, by the way, uh, saya bagi Saya bagi lapan lah untuk semua. Saya malas nak fikir dah. Okay, lapan markah kan? Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, yeah.